Babalu N. And perfect. Hello, why don't you go ahead and kick it off? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today is Charles. Ster today, Charles Sterling is with us. He will uh, walk us through the steps of creating updatable uh, Power BI reports by using Power Apps and Power Automate. Charles, it's great. It's my great, great pleasure to see you among us. Thanks for your time. Uh, without further ado, I'm uh, handing over to you. We are listening. Thank you, you. very much. Yeah. Um, so let's actually do, a, I guess, a, a quick introduction. And if you could go ahead and verify that you can see my screen. Am I sharing OK? And I should be yes. showing PowerPoint in designer mode. And I apologize it's not in in full view mode. Uh, it's just It seems to be a little bit slow when I do that. I don't know why. Um, it, look, it looks fine to me. OK, good. And. I've actually been with Microsoft about 29 years now, and most of that time has actually been in the developer division. And in the developer division, I actually did a lot of data-driven decisions. So we actually looked at a lot of different data sets from like Stack Overflow and ideas.visualstudio.com. And that's how I kind of got started on this. My background is also in marine biology, where actually I, I parsed a lot of data. So I guess I'm kind of a data scientist by natural predisposition. Yeah, um, taking that interest, I actually joined the Power BI team. And on the Power BI team, I was like, wouldn't it be great if we could capture the data and amend the data? I think this is probably what Kevin Morgan was actually wanting to do. Uh, we were chatting a little while ago, um, directly in his side of Power BI. So I started playing with something at that point called Power Apps. And I was using duct tape and hacking and iframes, but I got it working. And I was able to go out and capture and amend data in dashboards. So I can tell you why, if it's if it's important, why it had to be dashboards and not reports. Um, and using that information, I have since joined the Power Apps team. So this is kind of good or kind of interesting. And a lot of the inspiration for some of my work, Hello, came from you in turning PowerPoints into custom visuals. I don't know if you guys on this call know that if you actually want to use your PowerPoint in your reports, uh, there is a custom visual created by Halil called PeerViz, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, so we'll we'll get to make sure and get a link to that. But that was actually some of my inspiration was how do you actually take the best of both worlds and merge them? Um, and that's what you're going to see us doing. So without further ado, I've actually already done the integration, so we don't need to see this piece. What am I going to take a look at? Um, we just recently introduced a new Power Automate custom visual. So we're actually going to go ahead and take a look at that at the end. And then we're going to go out and show a brand new uh, capability using direct query for Dataverse um, and actually how to do write backs all the way through and some common misconceptions and confusion that we actually get all the time. As a matter of fact, I got this email this morning again. So this is how regular it is. And this is from an internal person. We have an internal user group. So with that, Let's actually walk through what people are asking to do. So what Kevin was talking about, ooh, uh, let's let Fatih, oh, Fatih's actually in. Okay, good. Um, what people like Kevin normally want to do is they want to write back to their Power BI data set. Now, they usually don't define what that is, and that means different things to different people because that's actually where the, the catch is, is, is a data set is not a data set is not a data set. Um, and what they do is they go out and they go out and query, hey, I want to write to Power BI data set. And what they find is they find a Power Automate action that has the term add rows to Power BI data set. Now, hello, I'm going to take you out of the out of the, the mix. You don't get to answer this. But does anybody know what this is doing and why it probably isn't going to solve your problem or what it what it is that most people want to do? So I know that um, that uh, Kevin Morgan's uh, microphone is, is working, so I'm going to have him unmute. And do you know what this does and why this is probably not going to solve most Power BI people's uh, challenges that they're looking to address? Just looking at it intuitively, it looks like it's just going to add new rows to the data set. OK, and, and you're absolutely right. So you're saying that I couldn't do an upsert or an append, and you're absolutely right. It doesn't do that. But 
the word data set is the is the catch there. When you go out and you create a, a Power BI report, Kevin, I'm assuming that you are actually going in. Oh, I can't believe I don't have Power BI running. Let's just go ahead and get it running. Um, that you are doing get data, right? Right. That's what that's what you're doing. Okay. It's usually, you know, we're connected to data flows. Oh, okay. So um, when he does when Kevin does get data, he actually chooses the data flow connector. And what that's doing, so let's actually just bring over this dialog box. Anything that you choose in here that says get data is using something called the mashup engine. Um, Halil could actually give you presentations on just that topic if you want, or actually we were talking about Marco Russo. He can actually go in for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and just talk about the mashup engine. But that's what all of this is doing is it's actually using something called the M language to go out and create these basically these analysis services as cubes underneath of the cur underneath of the covers that Power BI then layers their data visualizations on top of. OK, well, that makes sense. That's what Power BI is, right? Mostly, that's not entirely. It turns out that the data set here in this word is not create the data set that is created here. Turns out there are at least, well, there's two types of data sets. Um, there are those created by the REST API. And Marco Russo knows these very, very well as well, but they are not in analysis services cube. You actually create these programmatically or in the UI. Let's actually go ahead and see if I actually have a browser running. Yes, I do. Matter of fact, here's a perfect example of one. Let's actually do, a, a show you an example of this data set in covers. So it looks like I gave Reza 40 points for his last effort. Um, clearly, Halil deserves 50 for creating the Turkey user group. So he gets 50, he gets points. 50 points. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Kevin, if you see, I don't know, it was kind of subtle. It went through pretty quick that Halil now has 50 points. Did you see it come in and it just happened like that? There's a lightning bolt here. Yes. That should give you that should give you a clue as to what kind of data set this is using, and this is actually using that Power Automate um, action. So, Halil, I'm going to take you out of the embargo box. What does this indicate? Or maybe Kevin, you know what, what? What am I writing to, or what am I showing here? Do you know what this lightning bolt means? My guess yeah. would be, yeah. My guess is that. That's the symbol for a power automate. You, you'd think, sure. but it's not. And it was actually, it was, these tiles have been around long before power automate. If I go into my, my workspace and take a look at my data sets and data flows, actually I have one called scorecard. And this one is not like the rest. It is actually a streaming data set. Um, and all these other ones were actually created using the mass up engine. This one is not. So how would I create that? If I go out and choose new and I choose a streaming data set, you see there's data set and streaming data set. What happens is Power Automate has left out that pretty important word and that the only thing that this will write to is streaming data sets. About six months ago, it used to say add rows to a streaming data set. I don't know why we removed that word, but since then I've gotten about an email a week and saying, hey, I'm trying to write to this and I'm not seeing my data sets. Let me give you an example, or let me show you what that looks like. So if I go into and choose create, and I say I want an instant cloud flow, and I'm gonna go ahead and say, I'm just gonna manually trigger this. And I add a new step. And the new step is that Power BI uh, add rows to data set. And again, it should really say streaming data set because that's the only ones that can add to. And I'll show you what this means in a real world and why I get emails these questions. So the, the workspace that we're looking at is called Chaz1 or Chaz World. C oh, I went way too far. CH. See if you see one called Chuck's World for me. Oh, here's Chaz1. Okay. Now, when I look at data sets, I only see David, David's scorecard, and Shannon. A lot of schools of Tunisia, as you need fabulous. Yes. There, there's Shannon. an announcement in the background, Charles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me, let me, let me. You, Aya, is that how you pronounce her, her name? Aya. Uh, yes. 
OK, and you see that I see one, two, three, four data sets here. If I go back in here, oh, where am I at? If I go back in here, I clearly have more than four, but I have David, David's, Scorecard, and Shannon. And again, the interesting thing about these is that these are streaming data sets. So Power Automate add rows a data set only adds rows to real-time streaming data sets. So, and you can see what it did is it went through and grabbed the columns that I created when I went out and created that column. So here, here I am and I chose new streaming data set. Looks like I didn't finish this. I chose API. There's a couple different types of streaming data sets and they actually do behave differently, but I'm going to call this one Kevin. Whoops. And I want to go out and say that, let's say I want to keep Kevin's score and it's going to be sort of a text. Uh, so sort of, um, score, yeah, as a number. I want to say the date that we have his score is going to be date time and maybe name of the contestant and that's text. You get the idea. And what this is actually building is the definition of that um, of, of that data set itself. And if you've never played with streaming data sets, these are actually so much fun. This is actually one of the more fun things to do, but they have they don't look like all the rest of the data sets. They are quite distinct. And if I go out and actually run PowerShell, oh, run PowerShell, I can actually copy and paste this into here and if i go out and take a look at uh anyways i i wasn't going to go out and spend a whole bunch of time in streaming data sets but i can actually go out and use powershell or power automate to add entries so what actually let me look at that, what that powershell is doing is it's going to go ahead and put in uh, the date and this name so if i go out and grab that name and the scores I think it's 98.6 and I go out and grab some date. This and this is doing the exact same thing. And it's using a streaming data set to do it. Now, of course, this is hard coding it. You'd never do that. And I've got lots of labs on how to actually put in dynamic values. But that's the number one question I get all the time and why it probably will not serve your needs is because unless you happen to be using streaming data sets, uh, you're not gonna be able to write to it from Power Automate. Okay, before I go on, I wanna make sure there's no questions. Uh, Ayak, we muted you, I hope that was okay. I, I see that you're back. And if there's no questions, actually, let me look at the chat window and see if there's any questions. No. We don't, we don't have questions yet. Okay, not a problem. So let me go back to the slides and see where I'm at next. Um, oh, by the way, I just wanted to show that that scorecard that we were looking at, that was actually a streaming data set, and I already showed that. Okay, so the slides. Ah, the next one is, well, if that doesn't do what I do, Chuck, how do I get what I want, right? Well, then we actually have a conversation of where is your data? Because we need to push the data back into wherever your data is located, right? That's the big question. Most of my reports, if you look at my samples that I generally do, I'm scraping web pages. Well, clearly writing back doesn't make sense in those cases. But if I happen to be using SQL or Dataverse, it definitely does. So you really, really need to think about not just where your data is stored, also the latency between those updates and what Power BI is set to. If you're using some something called the gateway to update it, you actually have refresh intervals. And if your refresh intervals every two hours and you actually put data in there, uh, it may not look right, right? If I go out and say, hey, let's update this, this price to be $5 and you still say it's 10, you're gonna wanna keep updating it to $5 and $5 and $5 because you're not going to know that you need to wait two hours to see that actually populate back from the online database. So there's some architectural decisions around that. Um, and let's actually show you one of these in, in, in the wild, if you will, and actually build one. So let's go back into my Power BI uh, environment that I've got, my workspace. And look, actually, I thought I had that report already open. Okay, maybe not. 
let's open it. So the uh, the profit be the customer profitability sample is what we were just at. I want the Dataverse report. Let's take a look at that. OK, if I go ahead and take a look at this, you can see right here it's really subtle. It may be hard to see through teams, but this is actually refreshing and it looks like it hasn't pulled back the value for this val this um, visual. There you go. So now this report is actually pulled back. Now, if you see this, what does that tell you that this report's based on? Oh, I'll, I'll actually let you, I'll tell you itself. This report is based on Dataverse. You can tell that from the name, but it's also based on a brand new capability called Direct Query. So it used to be that you had to do an import for your Dataverse reports. This one does not. This is actually using something new that allows you to do Direct Query. Yeah? Um, so, Halil, I actually, can I get somebody to actually put up their hand maybe and describe the difference if you guys know? Fernando, my Mexi my friend from Mexico. Um, can you tell everybody what is the difference between a direct query and an import report in Power BI? Fernando shy. Halil, how about you? Can you tell our, our viewers and our audience? Uh, my my pre preference would be Ayşe Gül Hanım, Ayşe Gül Erkuş. Are you Hello. listening to us? Yeah, I, I'm listening, but I'm not sure about the answer. That's why I'm not talking that much. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I, I'll let you. I'll let you know. Yeah, yeah. So, in a, in an import, your database yeah. is going to be over here. I don't know if you can see my hand, and uh -huh. you're going to go out and say, "I'm going to pull all the values in," right? So if I deleted yeah. my database, that report would still work. It would work fine, right? Because you've actually pulled in basically the entire database. That's yeah, what okay. it, that's what import is. Now it yeah. just compresses it, so it's not going to be nearly as big, and it's going to be much, much faster. Now yeah. direct query, by contrast, goes out and says, I'm not going to pull in the data. I'm actually going to have a pointer to it. I'm going to pull back the, the data that you're looking at. Hmm. OK. Yeah? So, so what yeah. is import? Now, of course, the question becomes in a Power BI space, um, if I've imported it and it's no longer connected, if I update the data in my, my import scenario, how do I see the fresh data? And that's where the gateway comes in, right? And by default, in a shared workspace, you can get mm -hmm. eight refreshes a day. Or if mm -hmm. you're using a premium workspace, you can get 48 refreshes a day. Or if we go back out and look at these actions here, you'll see that there is an action that says, I want to actually go out and refresh a data set. And this will actually let me do it anytime I want based on a trigger or based on a button press. So mm -hmm. otherwise your import is gonna be stale data unless it happens to hit one of those refresh periods or I ask Power Automate to refresh it. Now, even when I ask it to start refreshing, if the data set's large, it may take a while. It may take a while to start if mm -hmm. you're in a shared capacity, and it may take a while to finish. So it's going to give you a, a sometimes a maybe like I was talking about. Remember I said you updated the price and you didn't see an update. That would be a a challenge with the using the import scenario. Okay, so this doesn't have that problem because Charles. Sure. Yeah. One question on that. So yeah, Kevin, go ahead. If you use that, is that just because you have, um, we have pro, so we only get the eight, right? Uh -huh. So if we wanted it more than eight times a day, we could use the Power App and that would do it. The, the you mean the Power Automate, the flow? Yeah. Action. Sure. Yes, yes, you could. Um, I think there's still gonna be a limit now, the oh. reason I say think is I know there's definitely a limit in the documentation. It says that you can only do so many per day. Now, the reason I put the word think in there is because we haven't, last time I looked, we hadn't implemented any code to actually hold you accountable or actually stop you at those, those number of refreshes. Okay. So we say that you actually only get N number, but we actually haven't stopped you from asking for more. And I don't know if we, if the team, I've left the Power BI team about two years ago, and I don't know if they've ever implemented that check, right? It'd be like saying, hey, 
you can only have a million rows, but we didn't stop you from adding more than a million. In this case, you can only have eight refreshes. I don't know if we've stopped you from actually doing more using this technique. Okay. Great, great, great question. So yes, you might potentially get more than that based on whether or not we've done any checks there. Um, direct query may solve your problem though, Kevin, that you uh, that we were talking about with Asagal um, or RC, um, where yeah. you are actually are already connected. So let's actually go out and show that in action. So uh, here is a tab in my report. And if you hadn't guessed from the UI, I actually I usually have these refreshed so you can actually see them, that I'm going to actually add a new value. So these are supposed to be computers. So let's add a new computer, and I need to add it more than $2,500. Otherwise, it tails off the end, and you can't find it. So the, my computer name is going to be called the Halil Humongous. <laughs> right? So that's the name of my, com my computer. And just so I don't spam a whole bunch of people, I'll use my email address. And I would say that if anybody's going to make a Halil Humongous uh, computer, be Acer. Acer would be the guy that would do the Halil Humongous. And the price... God, you know that you're going to definitely want to pay up to $3,000 because it's going to be the best ever. Now, I don't have a Hello Humongous at the bottom. And uh, actually, I, and I've only spent $15,000. If I spent $3,000, we expect to see more. So let's go ahead and, and save this to the back end. And I'm telling you that there's no gateways involved with this because I'm using direct query. Now, wait for it. You can, you can't see it, but oh, it's kind of quite a settle, but we now have a Halil Humongous computer at $3,000 and this has been updated. And you can actually see in the corner that, hey, things had been updated. Yeah. This is this is the Power Apps visual, Kevin, and it works really elegantly here because I'm using direct query with no refreshes. And this is gonna be dependent on your back end whether or not you can support direct query. There's a bunch of data sources that support it and there's obviously a bunch more that don't. Let's show you how to create this because the magic is obviously in this little app here. Let's go ahead and go in the Dataverse to do. You see that it's missing its app. And go ahead and click it and actually just resize it. And I really like this metaphor of the visuals themselves telling you how to use it. So hello, last time I used the peer viz, it actually didn't have this, but you actually should, when, when you drop it in, have directions on how to use the peer vis visual. Um, this is a great design pattern. I really like the, the fact that the Power Apps team did this. And in this case, I want to push out the name, the price, and the email address. So maybe, oh, and the manufacturer. So let's go to order and grab the email, the name, the manufacturer, and the price. And now, I don't want to put this in the default environment for all of Microsoft. There's several thousands of applications. I want to put it into my environment, and I think I've called it Chuck's World. Chuck's world. There we go. And I'm going to create a brand new one so you can actually see it starting from scratch. <coughs> now, underneath, the, uh, underneath the covers, um, what this is going to do is it's actually going to start building the app for me. Now, I'm not going to use any of the controls it gives you, but I do, I highly recommend um, you actually do take a look at the the controls, but like right off the bat, you can see that it gave me something called a gallery. Let's actually just change that real quick. So if we go out and, and take a look at the gallery and go to fields and change it from email to name, you'll actually see that here's those names that we saw here, right? So these, this data set, and I hate using that term because I've already overloaded it twice in this conversation. How about if we just say it's handing that data back here and I can actually change it to price and there's the price. In this case, we're actually not going to use this control at all. We're going to erase it. So it's gone. What I'm going to do is, let me see here. Oh, actually in, in that last sample, I actually was using icons. In this case, let's use buttons. So I'm going to add a button and we're going to say add. That's my add button. And we're going to have another button and this one's going to be my save button. Okay. So when I click this one, it adds a row. When I click this one, it actually persists it back to the database. That makes sense. What I need here is I need those, those, those fields, those columns, if you will. So we're going to go to forms. We're going to choose edit. And it's going to go out and say, hey, what data source do you want to use? And if you go out and take a look at the data source, 
Um, it is already wired up to Dataverse, but I could have actually chose SQL. I used to, or whatever. Um, I often, when I usually do this demo, I usually choose SQL, but today we're going to use Dataverse. And what we're going to use is this report is based off of order. So if I go back in here and type in order um, and look at the orders and edit those fields, let's go ahead and add those fields. Oh, how come I didn't choose? Oh, there it is. It just took a little while. Okay. I don't need credit on. That's not a good field for us. Name is a very good one. Uh, what are the other ones we said? We said email, manufacturer, and price. Price. Here we go. Okay. Now, Let's save that. Oh, I've forgotten some things. I haven't implemented my save button. So here we need to go out and say, oh, we actually haven't added a row either. We need, we need to implement both these buttons. Getting very sloppy, hello. Well, I'm not doing a very good job with my demo here, going back and forth. So we're gonna go out and say, a new form, and we haven't renamed this form, so it's gonna be called form one. Let's actually, let's rename the form. So that we should, we should rename it. That's, Let's go ahead and call this one order form. OK, now this is going to say new form and I want to have a new order form. And this one's going to say submit. We're letting James in. James, thank you for joining us. We're kind of in the, in the process. We can get you caught up if you need. Um, this is going to submit that form. And the form name itself, we already renamed it. It's called order form. Order form. Oh, why are you not seeing it? Well, oh, there it is, order form. Oh, I spelled it wrong. It's supposed to be O-R-D-E-R. -E okay, my fault, but you get the idea. Instead of order form, it's odor form. Apparently this one smells. Now, uh, I'm missing one other thing. So this one's gonna add a new row. This is gonna persist a new row. Um, now, had this been in a dashboard, this is we would be done. What's the difference between dashboards and reports to Power BI? Lots of things. The big one here is that dashboards are quasi real time, meaning that if the data underneath of the coverage gets updated, they update their tiles. Reports are static. They do not update their visuals unless you go into Power BI and say, I want to do a visual refresh. I'll show you that button but we need to issue a visual refresh. And the way you do that is there's actually a Power BI integration object refresh method. So this is where our integration object came from, and we're gonna do a refresh off of it. Okay, let's go ahead and save this one as Halil's app. What color do you like, Halil? Give me a color. Uh, blue. Blue, how about dark blue? Okay. Okay. And we'll and we'll give him a star because he definitely deserves a star. And we're gonna go ahead and show save, save it. And now if I hurry and I come back here, what you're gonna see is the Halil app in dark blue with a little star showing up, and it should actually have those um those form or those actually it won't have those fields on it because we haven't actually said I want a new I want a new row yet. So there's nothing to display because we're not sitting on a row record. So let's go ahead and add this. And now we actually see it. And we're actually going to say that this is the the Halil Humongous Humongous two thousand. And the email is still mine. So that way when we go to the next demo, I don't spam anybody. Manufacturer is still going to be Acer. And the price is now going to be, uh, should we make it more? We'll actually make it cheaper. So the, the Halil Humongous um, 2000 is actually 50 bucks cheaper or $500 cheaper, whatever it is. So when I save it, we have to watch it. We're at 18,000 and we don't have a Halil Humongous and we don't have anything in between here. When I hit save, we actually are writing it back and you can't quite see it, but up in the corners, it says I'm actually refreshing. It's right there. It's very difficult to see, but it says it's refreshing and it's still refreshing. I think my internet's kind of slow. And so you'll see you, that so the. Uh, you, uh, you, you are triggering the refresh from the power ups, right, Charles? Yeah, but the refresh that I'm doing here, it's really important, is the same as hitting this button, which is not what Kevin was asking about in the refresh. That is a data refresh. 
This is a visual refresh. Mm -hmm. and let, me, let me walk you through that. I actually have a slide on it. It'll save that. Say yes to save. And if I go to my data sets and I go out and look at one of these, and hit refresh here. This refresh is I want you, if I use the gateway, to refresh the data set. This is a data set refresh. And what we were looking at a second ago was the visual refresh. So there's a refresh button right here, and there's a refresh button in the data set. And they're quite distinct. Mm -hmm. So if I was doing import, I would need to do two things. I would need to say, hey, data set, go ahead and grab the new data from SQL Server or wherever, put it in Power BI. And after that completed, then I'd go out and say, hey, visuals, you've got new data to look at once you update your, your yourself. So that brings me to, I think, this slide. So this refresh, is actually refreshing the data set. So this is doing the same thing as uh, this. And the reason there isn't one here because this is a streaming data set. Remember those ones that say David's and Shannon and whatnot? They don't have a refresh, but this retail analysis, it does because it was an import. So this has refresh versus this is a visual refresh. And that's what that slide's trying to show is what is the difference between these going out and doing a refresh? This is a visual refresh, and this is a data set refresh. And this is what they look like inside of Power BI. One is this this little icon for visual refresh, and one is the data set refresh for the data set. All right, I'm gonna pause and see what Melis Ertz's question is. is Hello, I'm a very new U power new user to Power App. I wonder when user is entering some data by Power App, can we get this data's report? If so, how? Um, I think I just showed that. So this was. Let me do it one more time. So we'll go out and have the Halal Humongous three thousand, and this one is much better. It's going to cost five thousand dollars. Oh, Acer. Hey, what you're asking i want to make sure i understand what you're asking oh that's only 500 this is 5000 when i hit save we're actually gonna get another one so melis did you want to unmute yourself and and morgan or sorry kevin if you want to unmute yourself i i feel free go ahead and shout out your question thank you so much i think you understand me well uh i i mean when we entering the data by here how can we get the report that's what this is. I entered the data here and I'm actually showing the report. It all is based on the fact that this knows both Power Apps and Power BI is wired to a common backend and they both uh -huh. know about working on the same backend. In this particular example, it is a Dataverse backend. Typically, when I do this demo, I use a SQL Server backend, but that's the important part is that you've got the right hand called the Power App putting data in and you've got the left hand which is Power BI, looking at the same SQL server and reporting on it. OK, uh, maybe I can ask uh, like this. Uh, can we get report by Excel sheet? For example, how many uh, user is using the Azure? The how many users are uh, entering the price, which is above the $2,000 or something else? Those are great, great questions. Yes. So what you're actually asking about is usage reports. So you're <laughs> yes, not. Yes, yes, I mean that. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no, no worries. And, and usage reports in Microsoft comes from a couple different places. So, hmm. yeah, let's, let's, lock, let's walk through is, hey, did you as a user add data into a data source? Now, you could check that from the audit log. Right, so the audit log is a good place, and I have several different um, Power BI articles on how to actually. Here, let's just say audit log Power BI, and I know that my buddy Adam Sexton, guy in a cube, um, is actually 
actually that's not a good example. Um, so this is actually where Power BI started putting it in there, uh, accessing the Power BI activity log. Oh, here it is. Usage metrics. Oh, so this is my friend Reza down in New Zealand. This is he does great stuff as well. Um, I I thought mine would pop up to the top or Adams would be, but what they're saying is that here's the audit log, and here's how you actually pull it out. And this is actually taking a look at the usage metrics inside of Power BI. But that's not what you're talking about, Milel. You actually are saying, hey, what happens if I'm putting it into Oracle or whatever? In addition to the audit log, and I'll actually put this link in here. There's something called the Graph API. Um, who just did that? Oh, Krishna, the Houston user group, just did an article on how to actually access the Graph API from Power BI. And the one that I often will use, I will actually go ahead and instrument the applications to show when they're writing data, and in which case I would use something called Azure Monitoring to go out and show usage reports. But there's usage reports from the Graph API, audit logs, and application insights. And all of those are can be sources for Power BI reports. And that will tell me who deleted data, who wrote data, who <laughs> updated data, how many times did they look at? How many times did they open a report? How many times did they look at a dashboard? Um, you can't look at things. Actually, I think you can now. How many times did you actually run this um, this bookmark? So there's actually something new as well. Uh, Oscar's got one as well. So Power BI announcing the term usage. So yeah, so what Oscar sent a link to uh, is this report here. And that actually will show you, if you remove the filters, it will show you inside of one environment. Uh, sorry, they call environments workspaces in Power BI. It will show you inside of one workspace. If you want to look across all the Power BI workspaces, you remove the, the filter. No, that won't work. That still actually shows you only one workspace. You probably might want to use the audit log depending on if you have access and what the scope is that you want to look at. So. Take a look at what Rez is showing, and here he's going out and talking about the audit log directly. The problem that most people are going to have with the audit log is that it takes pretty elevated permissions. For instance, at Microsoft, I do not have access to the Microsoft audit log, and it has good reason. Um, if I had access to the audit log at Microsoft, I could tell you what time Halil checked or logs in the morning. Again, I'm not to infer that he, you know, doesn't arrive early and work late or whatever the case is, but I can verify that. There's a lot of privacy laws around that sort of introspection of employees, and they actually want to limit that and make sure that it's very intentional on whether or not you do that. I can see what kind of, of files they're accessing. Again, that's a, a fine for an admin, but you want to be intentional about whether or not you do that. So an audit log is actually, I find the best source if you have access. Go ahead and take a look at the graph API is the last one as well. Um, and that actually isn't quite as restrictive. And you can actually access that again from uh, Power BI. Let me put that right here. <clears throat> and that will let you access a lot of what is going into the audit log, but not have those same permissions. Okay, great, great question. This this graph API is one of the mysteries uh, for for me. Uh, it's it's touching too many subjects as far as I know. Yeah. It, I mean, it really. What it's what I'm telling you is that there's an API that will let you look at the usage of most Microsoft applications in your world. How many PowerPoints does somebody create? Where do they put their PowerPoints? Where, um, what are their names? How big are they? Um, how who opened them? How many times were they opened? Graph, oh. The Graph API will show you that, but imagine that for every application and everything that Microsoft does. So it's huge. Okay, uh, great, great questions. If there are no other, oh, Kevin, actually I cut you off. You had unmuted yourself. What was your question? <laughs> All right, thanks. So we don't have direct query back to our data sources, our, our main data source, but from time to time we have SharePoint lists that people put data into. Can this 
can SharePoint be a direct query so we could utilize this so someone adds it into the Power BI, it will add it back to the SharePoint list and be part of the data set. So what you're asking for, Kevin, uh, short answer, no. Um, okay. let, let, let's let's start with the, the simplest one is, is the answer is no. Um, matter of fact, what I'm looking at here, actually I thought that was it. Um, what, what sources support direct query? There is a table that will actually oh. give you the which ones. The number one request, I believe, last time I looked on ideas.powerbi.com was to support direct query for Power BI. So if you go to ideas.powerbi.com, I think like the number one request is to support direct query for SharePoint. Um, oh, it looks like it's uh, add expand feature columns, but it's in here. Go vote for it. Hopefully, uh, I think it's Will Thompson that owns that. And what happens is every time they go out looking to do it, because it is often requested, it's fairly expensive. Um, SharePoint wasn't originally always designed to be an RDBMS, and that's what we kind of count on. So I was actually going to pull that table out for you. No, I, I've seen this when I was okay. doing my, okay. my and, and there's a table in here is what, oh, Power BI data source, and maybe that's it. Or somebody else will pull it, pull it off for me. Um, oh, here it is. Um, so SharePoint. No, it does not support direct query yet. It is okay. an often requested feature. And what I actually do is, again, remember we talked about real-time streaming data sets? However, they're actually inputting the data back in your SharePoint list. If you can control that and get into that flow, if you're using a flow or that app, you can also pump out the telemetry to something like App Insights or a real-time streaming data set. And then you can actually go out and use a direct query report against it. So, and of course, that assumes that you can get in the chain for the updates and you will always see all updates always in all cases. Otherwise, you're going to have two sources of, of the universe or two, two views of the universe and they're not going to agree because someone went out and said, oh, I'm just going to update this SharePoint list directly, not using the app or the flow or the whatever. Okay. Millis, you have another question. Sheila Hart, thank you for joining us. <laughs> yes, I'm so sorry. I have too much uh, questions. Uh, this is my last question. I'm wondering that if I use the Power App user form, can I create a data pool? A data pool. Tell me what you mean by data pool. I want to make sure I understand. Uh, for example, in my company, uh, we need to create a data pool uh, weekly and uh, I will um, I'm planning to use the power app uh, user form and the sales guys will enter the some sales informations in it then yes. uh, I want to collect all informations uh, end of the week but the uh, little information is, thing, uh, is that and we are refreshing the Power BI data every day twice, time, uh, two times. So you want to have so an in, you want to have an interim storage location. So they're updating them every hour, every couple of minutes, but you only want to actually pull that up into a big uh, a big chunk of data once an hour or once a day. That's what you mean by data pool. Uh, we are refreshing at the morning and at the evening, but the uh, sales guys will enter the data depend on the day. I want to collect them, for example, in an Excel or something else. It doesn't matter, but I want to create a data pool by their entrings. Okay, so you want to put it into two, two different places. You want to put it in an Excel yeah. spreadsheet and you want to put it into a, um, a the Power BI backend that you're using, and this is actually a great example where it says add rows to data set. Um, I could easily go out and add another action that says add rows to common common. Oh, it's called Dataverse now. Common data. Let's see if it's actually got there. Yeah, here it is. Uh, add a new row. Okay, so now when I run this, it's actually let's let's get rid of that refresh data. Um, okay, 
using this flow, if I actually use this, I would put a row in a Power BI data set and another row in a common data uh, service. In this case, there is also Excel. I could go out and add rows to Excel. I could go out and, yeah. and add email to it. So if I had my form, my button, call that mm -hmm. flow, not the form directly, or bo do both, I could do both. I could then go out and put it in lots and lots of places all in one shot. Remember how I was talking to Kevin about if you can get in front of that SharePoint list, we could very easily go out and, you know, let's actually, yeah, add a row. There we go. And here, add a row to SharePoint. In this case, this is what I was talking to Kevin, is that I could add it to SharePoint and something that supports direct query. In this case, for Umily, I could actually go ahead and add it to your database and that pool that you wanted to. Add a created item is what they call it. Okay, so this one actually would shove it into four or five places in one flow. And then what you do is you change your app to not go out and do the submit form. That's not what you do. What you do is you go out, actually, let's save this. Uh, table name. I don't want a table name. I just want you to save it. Come on. I think I think we're going to start. Fill, it's going to force me to fill out all these. And I don't really want to do that. All right, yeah. The demo code is not with you today. Oh, no, no. It, it's, it, it, it's, it's because I was actually trying to proof of concept this without actually doing it. But what you would do is under here, have the button say Power Automate is you would actually go ahead and call that flow. In this case, this is actually the scorecard one. This is actually a great one because you actually already saw this one. And it says, hey, scorecard flow, you need to add uh, the score. So let's go ahead and use the price because price is good. So price is whatever this is called. Um, data card value five. So I can go in here and say data card value five. Probably needs me to go out and say price data card. Yeah, that's right. Price data card dot data field dot. Anyways, you get the idea. It's actually, which is hard to put it because that way you can get it, get an idea. But what you would do is have this button reference these text fields. In this case, what we're going to do is say um, five. And oh, the name is actually the first one. So the name is actually Malay. Um, Malay slash Melissa. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the next one is five, and the next one is the date. Um, okay. Now, but instead of using these hard these hard coded strings, you'd actually reference these text boxes. And, I can, and we can show you how to do that. That's pretty easy. Um, and now when I run this application and hit save, it's going to go ahead and push it back into the, um, the scorecard application. So let's actually find that scorecard application. And scorecard data set. No, we're actually in the data sets. Scorecard. Actually, I think we're showing it underneath of this dashboard. Here we are. And you actually see Malie in here for five. There you are. See five. And we go back in here and stop the application and give you, oops, this one, and give you 500 and run it. And you'll actually see that, uh, there we go. There's you of 500 points. Look at that. And again, that's how you would actually go out using Power Apps right to pools of data and your Power BI backend if that's what you wanted, if I'm understanding it right. Okay, Oscar asks, is it possible to update some Power BI data set via Power Apps? And I think I've showed that a couple different times in a couple different ways. So yes, yes and. Sheila, thank you for joining us. Is this being recorded or does Charles have a recording of a similar demo? That is a great, great question. I have something better than the recording, and yes, this is being recorded. I promise I'll give it to him. But where would you find these <laughs> yeah. steps? Because I actually have kind of gone off path. 
several times. Let's go back in here. You go to aka.ms forward slash power apps training. So actually let's highlight that and the directions for these labs. So like we're actually going out and doing a build your power app solution, getting started with power. That's not the one power apps. And uh, there is this one that we're looking at right now. Oh, it's, maybe it's called a step by step integrating power apps with the power BI. That sounds like the right one. And here are the links. This one's using that streaming data set. This is what I was showing you, and it actually has all those steps. Additionally, there is one on integrating Power BI with Power Apps. There's another one, and I think this is using that custom visual that is not using a streaming data set, and it is not. So this is actually the steps on how to do it, and yes, they're being recorded. Uh, and Oscar, and, and hello, I'll answer it as well. Okay. Uh, we're getting kind of close on time, and I don't think I've done a very good job of actually moving forward. So let's do that. In addition um, to running flows from like a push button, I showed you how to do that. You can go out and do interesting things from alerts in Power BI. So if I go to a dashboard and look at um, like the count of score, you'll actually see that there's a little notification here. Um, and if we go out and take a look at it, and say manage alerts, you'll see that I have an alert called alert count of score. Now inside of Power BI, it says that, hey, once it's above five, I'm gonna go ahead and alert people. Matter of fact, if I open up my inbox and pull that over here, um, almost certainly I would have actually generated that alert. But what happens in the case of why is this not coming in? They should have been there. Oh, I see why, because I'm actually, I was searching for your name, hello. So I had to have your name in it. Um, okay, here it is. Oops, let's try that one more time. Okay, so this is the Power BI alert that came from me actually adding values in there. In this case, we didn't use this power app. We actually used the one we created, and we have Malay, who actually now has 500 points. And it goes out and says that the, the threshold's five, the current value is 29. So that was actually not the last one, but the one before that we added in there. Now, why do I bring this up? Why is this interesting? It One of the more common requests were, well, if it's above five, I wanna let Kevin know that there's something going on. If it's above 15, I probably want to send a text message to Kevin and email him. If it's above 500, I probably want to let my manager and email and text and phone me, right? So what you would do is actually go ahead and run Power Automate to go out and say, what is the value? And based on a different condition, send do to corresponding actions. You saw how we actually go ahead and send it to a SharePoint list you can actually do that in the values of an alert from a dashboard. That was actually the point that I actually wanted to make in this particular slide. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, now uh, we only got six minutes left. I'm gonna have to owe you this one, but the interesting thing is, is I can actually put Power BI tiles inside of my Power. Actually, no, it won't take a second. Let's actually show that to you. So if we go back into our application, stop it, and just push it down a little bit. I can go in and go to insert charts, add Power BI tile, go out to my workspace, which was the C Chaz world or Chuck's world or something, Chaz one, there we go. And the dashboard is, uh, sure, why not? I'll go out and see what, what is this? Average is gonna be fairly interesting because that's a card. Let's actually see if we can find a, an interesting one. Uh, clearly what you're seeing me do, there we go, is actually walk through those tiles. And I can actually have a lot of these and I can have my buttons actually update them from environment to out, environment and dashboard to da dashboard. So that is another interesting way of it going out and doing things in Power Apps that you can't do in Power BI by displaying Power BI tiles here. Okay, that didn't take too long. 
The last thing I wanted to, to demo for you was all of these examples I've showed you so far basically are thinking about one row at a time. What happens if I actually want to go out and update all of the people that their order is going to be ahead of schedule or um, it's going to be cheaper than expected? So let's go ahead and open up this report and go in here. And I think I have a, a table right here that shows all the orders, including the hello humongouses that we just added. Um, and we're just going to wait for a second. So I want to let all those people know, you know, some information. So I, I want to grab their, maybe their price has gone down. So all of these people. And this is why I keep using my email address so that way you guys didn't get a bunch of email if I did it wrong. So what we're going to do is go edit just like what we did for the Power Apps one, and you'll see that there is a new set of custom visuals. So you have to download these from App Source or a custom visual, and we add these, and it looks a lot like the Power Apps. It says, hey, to use it, you just need to add those fields. So let's actually make it kind of the right size. There we go. And just like on the Power Apps one, ah, there we go. Just like with the Power Apps one, it says, what fields do you want to use? So I'm going to go ahead and pass in the email, the name, and the price. I won't even bother with the manufacturer. At this point, I'm going to edit this. And this is actually even, a, I think, a more elegant solution than what Power Apps does. What it's doing is it's putting the Power Automate or the Flow Designer directly inside of Power BI. And we're going to go ahead and create a new one, an instant from cloud. And it automatically is, knows that I'm going to use a Power BI button. Or <coughs> think of it as a um, 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 bookmark button, press. And in this case, I want to send email. So we're going to send email to all these people. And in this case, it is inside the Microsoft tenant. And we don't allow this connector, so we're not going to use that one. And then we're going to say send email. And here, who am I going to send it to? So what we're going to do is add dynamic content, and I have two emails. This one is actually the creator, so it's going to be the same email, and this one is going to be all the emails that came in from that data set. And again, I use that word data set, and I shouldn't probably because it's a little bit overloaded. But before I add it, I want to show you something that right now it just is going to send it once. But this is an array or a series of rows that could all have different email addresses on every row. So when I add this, it automatically puts it into a loop and it automatically passes in the value of those email addresses. And let's go ahead and pass in the, um, the name of the product and we'll actually go out. Oh, the price is a number and this is a text field, so it doesn't like that. So it's actually just passing the name twice. We'll save this. Oh, looks like it's actually going to, I should have called this some name other than Okay, it's called API Connection, so remember that name. Now, when I go back to Report and go to Edit, I need to bind it. Um, so let's go out and find that one called API Connection. should be right in here. Come on. API Connection, and then choose Apply. Now, when I go back to Report, and I go to Reading View, say, yes, I want to save changes, and I hit run flow, what it does is it passes in all of the data. And actually, had I filtered this, let's say that I filtered it down to ASUS. Do I have any ASUS in this table? Uh, hmm. Surprised that we're not seeing a subset of these. How about if I choose this one? Oh, there we go. Now, had I run this flow, let's actually run this flow one more time. In this case, I only send one email because the data set only had one email. But if I go ahead and open one of these, you can actually see that I passed in the name of the body as hello and the name of the subject as hello. And I sent it to the person who actually was from that data set. So this is it working from hitting data flow. And I can actually walk through large data sets from Power Automate. So I am exactly to the minute on time. And that's kind of what I wanted to cover. So hopefully that was what Halil was looking for. Hopefully, Kevin, that actually answered some of your questions. Malie, hopefully that answered some of your data pool questions. And Sheila, um, I, I don't know if you had a question or not, but thank you for joining. And I 
appreciate the Turkey user group for hosting me. Hello, back uh, to you. Thanks a lot, Charles. That was a hell of a session. We should be doing uh, more meetups with you. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't aware of that. You you are that good at presentation. That was an excellent session, definitely. Would you, would you like to uh, say a few sentences about the desktop version of Power Automate? Yeah, so the, the desktop Power, of Autom Power Automate is a, a new set of features. So what I showed you here um, let's actually go back to the designer, and I apologize. I don't think I have it installed. I, had I known that you would ask for this, this lets me go out and build what's called a cloud flow, where I can actually go out and take a trigger coming in. Maybe my garage door opens up, and I then go out and write a row to a SharePoint site and, or a, an Excel spreadsheet or whatever the case is. Now, the desktop version actually adds some really cool capabilities where I can automate my desktop applications. Let me give you an example. Let me think of an example. Um, oh, I got one. I'm a scuba diver. I don't know if you knew that or not. I, I enjoy scuba diving. And one of my old log applications for scuba diving, you, you keep create logs, um, doesn't have a database exposed and it doesn't have any API. It was a very, 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 very old application. Um, so what I could do is I could go out and use the desktop version of Power Automate to record me binding rows from a database and echoing the keystrokes into that application, right? So think if you have a mainframe application, it never had any automation interface. It doesn't have any database that you can access, but if you can open it up in Windows and type into it, you can use the Power Automate desktop to automate the, and we also call it robotic automation, where you can actually echo keystrokes into this application. And that would allow me to go out and update my old scuba diving log with all of my current data from a cloud data source. That's a great question. Thank you for actually asking that. Thanks for that. Um, any further questions from the audience? Oscar, just uh, unmute yourself and ask your question if you if you have a question. Yeah, Oscar, go ahead. He Mr. Rojas is typing, I think. <laughs> okay. When is the next session? <laughs> yeah. Hello, that's a question for you. <laughs> exactly. We should be having more frequent meetups with you uh, for, for sure. This is one of the most interactive one uh, we had uh, for the last two years. I'm sure about this. <laughs> um, I've been actually going to nominate uh, one of my coworkers is much better than me, Kelly Kai. Uh, if you could get her, she actually does a lot of the monthly updates and you might be able to get her to come in and do a monthly update for you. Hello. I, I think she's too busy. He's not uh, getting back to me currently, uh, Okay. but I'm chasing for her. Okay. <laughs> well, with that, if there's no other questions, hello, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I love the power viz um, visual that you guys have done and uh, thank you for letting me actually join the tricky user group. Otherwise, do watch out for the um, Power BI. So if you haven't actually gone out and you want to know when the next user group is, um, go to community.powerbi.com. Uh, powerbi.com. There we go. And right over here, there's an option that says uh, user groups. And there's almost a user group going on practically every night. Um, so if you wanted to know, like, when, literally, when is the next user group? Um, the Chicago user group with Power BI tips. My friends Mike Carlo and Tommy Puglia was yesterday. Uh, tomorrow is um, the Portland user group, and I think you said Marco Russo's today. Oh, uh, is, yeah, he, he will be presenting today. Yeah. So um, go to community.powerbi.com. I think I'm. Oh, I see what's happening. Is there was a, an error there, um, and now go to the Power BI user group experience. That was actually right there. And, ah, come on. Say join user group. Oh, I guess we can get redirected here. Go to Power BI user groups. You know, I'm gonna actually put that link in there so you don't have to go through the, that process. And you can find a group or what it, I'd even recommend maybe even more, more tactically for you. Oh, we were just talking about Kelly. And the Portland user group is tonight. So you want to actually know about this one. And this is the one for Marco Russo. So Marco Russo, if you haven't actually saw seen him, 
uh, it, legend. There, there's no, no other way to describe it. Um, and I'm going to sign up because I want to actually catch up with Marco. <laughs> Hopefully Alberto will be there as well. And that's all there was to it. I'm now registered. That, that Literally, that's all there was to it. And here's the Teams link for actually seeing Marco. And one hour is actually in one hour. The community has been always great uh, in, in everything at Microsoft, Power Apps, Power Flow, uh, Power Automate, Power BI. Without community, we've been lost. Yeah, without a doubt. I, and you guys make my job worth doing. I, I mean, I really do get inspiration validation and energy from you so thank you hello Likewise. i'm gonna actually I'm, I'm gonna close off and i want to thank you again and the tricky user group for having me you have a great day and good luck with that weather thanks a lot Charles. <laughs> see you thanks a lot thanks for Bye, joining see. us and thanks a lot for your participation ayshegul melissa and kevin thank you